Is your dog anxious? Are you? It's getting exceedingly difficult to live a fear-free, or what I call a life unleashed these days. Many dogs are anxious. Many people don't know how to respond to the anxiety. I'm here to tell you how it's done. Today, I'm focusing on general anxiety. So under this umbrella comes noise sensitivity, social anxiety, where they're with other dogs or other people, travel, and separation anxiety. So there's little things you can pick from this talk that relates to all anxieties. But in terms of focusing on just one, I'm not doing that today. I'm doing general anxiety, which again, I feel on a daily basis. Now, I feel it when I open the newspaper or I turn on the news or I'm dealing with my teenage kids. My general anxiety is commonplace with everybody else. It's different than a dog's anxiety. And a dog's anxiety can be universal. It's not in your house when everything's calm and copacetic. But if there's any unexpected change, like somebody comes in, that can tip off anxiety. If you're walking on a leash and the dog sees another dog or a person, that can tip off anxiety. Taking them to the vet or taking them on a long car ride or taking them in a plane, hopefully next to you. There are many airlines that'll let you buy a seat for your dog. I'm a little leery of flying a dog under the belly of a plane because now there are delays and there's weather patterns. Travel anxiety can be in a car. Some dogs are just petrified of a car and anything that has a motor. So let's look at it. Let's focus on what are the first signs that you might see or hear that your dog is getting anxious. Let's define anxiety from your dog's point of view. The goal in having a dog, the number one thing they wanna feel, the number one thing they have to feel before they feel bonded and loved and loving in return is they have to feel safe. If your dog doesn't feel safe, they will not be able to relax. And relaxing is the opposite of anxiety. So I would define anxiety based on just my own personal experience and my experience working with dogs, is any sudden flux of worry when their life becomes unpredictable. So for example, some dogs might feel anxious when you shout at them. I would feel anxious if somebody I love shouted at me. So hence why I recommend not being aggressive with dogs because they don't interpret it the way you interpret it. So some dogs feel anxious with their people because they can't predict their moods. They can't predict if the person's going to be happy or mad at them when they come home. That can form anxiety. Anybody would understand that. They can feel anxious if they hear, see, or sense something that they didn't in their early socialization period. It's a sympathetic nervous system. Remember that from high school biology or another one of my podcasts because I talk about it all the time. We have parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, calm, relax. That generally happens in their den when nobody's around. They feel very parasympathetic and relaxed. That's all brain words and lingo. Then they're sympathetic, which you know more is fight, flight, or freeze. So if a dog is startled, if a dog feels anxious or defensive, or they don't know which way to turn, they're going to fight to whatever is triggering their response. They're going to flee, which means off leash, they would just run for the hills. Or three, they just freeze. So sympathetic, parasympathetic. You have to watch that when you bring your dog out of the house and you have to know what triggers them and you have to know how to read their posture to know what they're feeling and what they might do next. I know when a dog lowers itself to the ground, drops its tail, pins its ears back, does a little gr what looks like a grin, not happy, it's called a submissive grin or tight mouth, they hold their mouth tight, that they're not feeling joyful. I'd say a good 90% of aggression that you see and you think, wow, that dog's really aggressive. Aggression is just a bodyguard for fear. So in most cases, 
dogs that are forced to react on a leash or they're looking anxious and barking, maybe the approach avoid, that's an anxious dog. And there are things you can do to help your dogs and there are things you must do to help your dogs feel more grounded, more bonded, and more assured that you will take care of the situation because if you don't step in there and train them with positivity and consistency and you don't expose them, they're gonna be left with anxiety forever. Fun fact, I am terrified of clowns. Now, I'm in my 50s, not giving you the exact number, but I'm up there. I can cope now seeing a clown. Don't like it. I don't mindfully seek out clowns or paintings of clowns or pictures of clowns, videos, movies, clowns. I turn it off. But I don't like clowns. And when I was young, I was really afraid of clowns. It was very strange because I'm not really afraid of anything. So... Even today, if I see a picture of a clown, I can feel my cortisol, my stress brain hormone dripping. Maybe I wasn't exposed to enough clowns when I was little. Be that, it's not the issue. But the anxiety your dog feels can't be explained to them with words or reason. And that's an issue for your dog. Because if I have a dog that has been attacked by a free ranging dog. Let's say I'm walking my dog on a leash, I was walking someone's puppy this morning, and an off leash dog just beelined out of nowhere and came up to us. Now, I stayed very calm, I threw treats at the dog, distracted the dog, the owner got the dog, but when that dog was beelining towards me and the puppy, whose name is Lulu, funnily enough, because my dog's name is Lulu, as that dog was beelining towards us, her tail dropped, she kind of dropped to the ground, she looked worried because it wasn't predicted. She didn't know what was happening and I didn't have time to prepare her. I know you guys can relate to this. I know you can. So many people have heard stories or, or been involved in a dog attacking, you know, or just running up to their dog unpredictably. So Lulu, that I was walking at the time, got anxious. Now, I'm gonna tell you how to deal with it, but the first thing I did that you must remember is I put myself between my dog and the distraction. So if your dog is afraid of a car, if your dog is afraid of someone walking up quickly, you will know it because they will shrink. They often skitter behind you because they wanna feel protected. They drop their ears their mouth shuts and they lower themselves to the floor. So whatever it is, the number one rule of helping your dog cope and feel less anxious in the world is to get yourself between your dog and what's distracting them. Number two, you must stay calm because your dog, when they feel anxious, they're brain floods with adrenaline so it can react to their fear. If you get hyper aroused, I call it hyper aroused, whether you're scared or you're angry at what's happening or you're frustrated with your dog, when you get hyper aroused, your brain floods with adrenaline. And there are studies that suggest, and I believe, that dogs can smell the hormones that are circulating in your bloodstream like perfume. So if your dog can sense your brain body chemistry. It's either gonna make them feel more safe or more trapped in the moment. I.e. if you have them on a leash, they're trapped. They can't run away, they can't really fight, they can't really freeze, because you're you've got them in a vice grip, right? So it's important to stay calm. And I say this repetitively to people who have dogs that pull on the leash, that may be more aggressively inclined to attack another dog, you want to stay calm because you want to model what you're hoping and teaching and conditioning your dog to mirror. So if they get anxious and you get hyper aroused trying to deal with this situation, they're not going to calm down. All the while, we're thinking of this situation from your dog's perspective. Dogs do not cognitively understand the realities of a leash. 
So if you pull on it, they're going to feel trapped. It's going to make their anxiety worse and their reaction much more profound. I want you to think, close your eyes and think, your home is their den. It's where they want to feel safe and where they can generally predict the ongoings of everyday life. Your yard or the neighborhood you walk them in is their territory. It's familiar, they generally mark it with their elimination. Everything else is taking them into the world beyond. Whether you're taking them on a long walk, hike, or excursion, or you're taking them to a village, or you're driving over to a friend's house. Everything beyond the scope of their home, aka the den and their territory, aka the yard or neighborhood, is going to create um, more awareness to their surroundings. So take just walking your dog in an unfamiliar, or even out in the territory. What might trigger anxiety in your dog? How can you tell? Number one, signs of anxiety are a higher state of arousal. So a dog that is anxious will look around basically for what might happen. When is that sky going to fall? What is going to happen? I can't predict it. Therefore, I'm more alert and aware of what might go wrong. Not all dogs are anxious like this, but many are. And if you have one, you'll notice. Tail stops moving. Body becomes still. Mouth is often closed. Eyes can be scanning. Ears, when the trigger hits, when they see something, a car or a bike or a skateboard, they're either going to covet their space, lower down, ears down, eyes down, or they're going to bark very loud. And in either case, the root emotion is often anxiety. And it's often there because you're not doing anything to direct them. So far, to reiterate, we know we have to stay calm to model the right behavior, model the behavior we want to see. Number two, we have to position ourselves between the dog and the distraction. Number three, and this is really the enchilada, is your dog has a red zone. That is a set distance from the distraction in which they lose the ability to cope or think normally. One thing that definitely divines they're in a red zone is if you give them a treat or bounce a toy that they generally delight in and they don't respond. That's a cue. I'm in the red zone. I got to get out. So the third step is increase the space in or distance, increase the distance from what is triggering their anxiety and give them time to process. Now, when I explain this to my clients or when I'm doing a virtual call, I like to explain it this way. When we're afraid, maybe there's like, I don't know, uh, a loud sound that I can't decipher and I'm scared. Maybe it's late at night and I don't know what it is, but I'm scared. I get scared. My body flushes with all the same hormones that do for my dog, but then I reason and process because I'm a human and I can do that and I'm living in a human world. So I reason and process, and then I feel calm, or if I don't know what it is, I'll use all that adrenaline to flee. Your dog can't reason and process our insanely chaotic and ever-changing human world. They can't do it, they're dogs. So when your dog reacts, what you need to do is help them to process what it is. And the first step is to move them away from it and give them a little bit of time. There's nothing wrong with once you've moved away from it, leaning down, um, gently caressing your dog's body. I call this the soothing effects of mother tongue. This is how their mama cleansed cleanse them when they were little, and it's very soothing. So you can pet them. You don't want to whip out treats and toys and give them 16 commands because they're too aroused to process much. But by mirroring, maybe sitting down on the floor, petting them um, until they're breathing normally. Now that's a big cue. So a dog that's anxious in the moment might freeze up, but once they're relaxing and getting out the anxiety, they're, they can do really heavy pants. <sighs> that's a sign of a dog that's um, either thirsty, obviously, 
or is anxiety. It has had, just had a thrust of anxiety and is letting out some of the tension. If you happen to have a bone in your pocket or your bag, that's another good way a dog can release some of the anxiety, that fear that flooded their body with anxiety. But by getting away from it and giving them a bit of time, it allows them to process that it's not going to come, it's not going to harm us, and that you have good answers. And you seem to have been here, done that, experienced whatever they're afraid of before, because why? You're calm. Hey, let's go this way, get away from that thing, and just chill out. Once they chill out, you'll know because they'll be willing to interact with you. Their body will be looser. They'll take some treats. When I say anxious, the baseline emotion is fear, right? They're afraid um, maybe that dog will attack them that's coming towards them on a leash. They're afraid the person is walking straight at them it might be harmful. Fun fact, Humans are the only mammal that view face-to-face -face direct approach as a positive thing. Teeth gleaming, hi, a hug. None of those things are positive in any other mammal on the earth except a human. Certainly not a dog. A straight line approach to a dog could cause anxiety just because you're walking quickly towards them. So again, the common phrase is to say my dog has anxiety, but under that anxiety is the emotion fear. Okay, so now let's apply these three actions to other states of anxiety. I'll coach you so that my goal with the podcast are to help you innately know what to do because I can't outline every situation in the world, but I can outline a few and get you on the, on the road to thinking more like a dog. Number one, dog, put yourself between the dog and the distraction. Number two, stay calm, assume a been there, done that attitude. Number three, increase the space and give your dog the time to process what just happened as you stay calm and you're reassuring. How do we know they've gotten back to kind of neutral? We know because they'll eat food or they'll play or they'll just interact in a loose manner. Loose is good with a dog, right? We walk, we kind of walk like sticks. But a dog, when they're happy or they feel calm, they, they're more loosey-goosey and their tail is wagging and their head is bobbing around and they're standing in a normal posture. So let's apply our three go-to actions to another type of anxiety, social anxiety. So uh, whether you've rescued your dog or maybe you have a dog you had during the pandemic or a dog you just didn't have time to socialize to a lot of different people. You know, sometimes people just have, don't have a lot of people in. So their dogs are really calm with their parents and people in the family, but they develop a real anxiety about being social with other dogs and being social with strangers. How do we know this? We know this because they freeze up when they get close to them. Um, they don't approach people they don't know. They may either hang back or bark and, and threaten the person. That can also be a sign of anxiety. I just don't want you to come in my personal space. And if you haven't given them any good coping skills, you haven't taught them how to act, they're just doing what comes naturally, which is because I'm on a leash, because I can't escape you, I'm gonna bark so you stay away from me. If that sounds like your situation, whether people are in the house or you go out or you take the dog to the vet, the dog just doesn't like people in their personal space, then we have to remember, we can't change the dog instantly, not a machine. It's definitely not gonna respond to discipline. Here's why. If they don't like people to begin with, and then you see a person or somebody comes in, and now you're shouting or shaking a can or throwing a chain or zapping them with a collar or hissing and poking, it's not gonna make them love having people in more. In fact, it's gonna make the dog more reactive, maybe even aggressive to people coming in over time. So skip the negativity, they're a dog for God's sakes, and they're just simple, sweet creatures. So now we have a dog that's reactive when people come into your home, let's say. So 
You don't have to take the dog to the door every time somebody comes in. If your dog doesn't like people coming in, having them walk up to the mouth of the den, AKA your door, and open the door and have some big looming figure standing there with a box or, or a vacuum is going to startle them because that doesn't even look like a real person. So when you open the door and your dog gets afraid or aggressive, they're saying, there is a zombie! There's a zombie coming in our house! Get away, get away, get away! Now, if you start yelling, flailing about, getting all hyper-aroused because your dog's reacting, the dog's gonna get more reactive. Newsflash. So, there are a few things you can do. And not everything works for one dog. Not every technique is a forever because you're always on that road to helping your dog feel more relaxed so they can lead an unleashed life. But in the beginning, it's not gonna work to let them go to the door, stand in front of you, react like Cujo, and have you respond in a hypermanic level. Okay, so an anxious dog doesn't want to be stuck in a foyer or at the door, feeling anxious, having you scream, all this chaos, it's way too much. You need to dial it back. You can put your dog in the backyard with a bone. My, I have, my two male dogs are called the hooligans. They're totally different breeds. They love each other. And we just call them a hooligan because they're big and they run around and they love to roll in the mud and jump in the lake and come in all wet. So anyhow, when people are coming into my house with six cats, a tortoise, a bunch of rabbits, um, two Havanese and the hooligans, if they have any fear of dogs, I put the hooligans, AKA Skippy and Wahoo, out in the back with a bone. They don't get bully sticks unless somebody's coming in, so it's a special occasion. And once they've, re they love when people come over. I mean, they relish it. All my dogs are like, they're either therapy dogs or they will be therapy dogs. And they are not aggressive, but they're buoyant. So what I do with them is I get bully sticks and I only use for when company is over. I throw them in the backyard, which is fenced. And I just leave them out there while the person is coming in and getting adjusted. It can be terrifying for people. And we don't know who they are to be approached by a dog, even in joyous manner. You have to respect strangers. You don't just let your dog run up to every dog and every person they see, even if they're completely friendly. So when you are welcoming somebody, you can put your dog in a crate. You can put your dog in, your, in their sleeping area. Um, my dogs sleep in the bedroom where they have their beds. You can put them in the backyard with a bone. Give them time to process and release the adrenaline and excitement that comes with a new person coming into your home. Then, if you want to introduce them, which you don't have to, but if, you, if the person wants to meet your dog or they're gonna be overnight visitors, the introduction should either happen at a neutral location, like a cafe, if your dog's more relaxed with new people when they're at a neutral location, out on the street by your home or in the house, but once both the dogs and the people are settled. Reality check. If your dog is at all aggressive with people, you need to get them used to a muzzle if you plan to have friends in the future. So if your dog's anxiety is so pronounced that they bite to defend their personal space, the inside of your home is tight quarters to a dog. They can't run away. So if you have an anxious dog that inside you are worried about might bite the person, put him on a muzzle. It beats a lawsuit any day of the week. And there are a million videos on YouTube about how to positively condition your dog to a muzzle. So, you're not going to rush the introduction right away if your dog is undone by people visiting. If your dog is a little anxious, they can calm down quickly if directed. Then you can also leave them dragging a leash. I just take a little puppy leash, half inch or three-eighths of an inch wide, cut off the handle because the handle gets stuck on 
doors and, and other things. And then you can calmly just step on the leash when greeting people. So once your dog is, is more copacetic, once your dog's responding, can regulate their impulsivity, then you can let them drag a leash and simply step on it as people come in. Your dog might jump up and down, but where can they go? You're stepping on the leash. Now, you don't want to step on it so tightly that your dog feels like their neck is caught in a trap or their body is trapped. You want to step on it so they can sit, stand, lie down, and move about just about six inches. Now, let's say the person coming in would like to meet your dog and you're stepping on it, waiting for them to calm down. You might have given them a bone or throw some treats on the floor to redirect them. When the person approaches, read your dog's posture. If their head is pinned down and their tail is tucked under anxious state and they're licking their lips or their mouth is closed or they're um, avoiding direct eye contact, that's a sign, or they're shaking. If they're anxious, tell the person to stop. Give them a hot dog. Tell them to just throw hot dogs at your dogs without making eye contact for a half an hour. Why don't you make eye contact? Because we know direct eye contact, direct facing can be seen as challenging, especially by an anxious dog, a socially anxious dog. Now, I know I've gone over a lot, but socially anxious dogs should not be forced into their red zone. A red zone is a place in which they stop eating, they stop socializing with you, they stop feeling comfortable, and they stop responding to directions. If your dog is socially anxious, please get them out of the red zone. You, if they love treats, if they love a toy, recognize the red zone is the place in which they stop responding to those positive cues. And they stop engaging you. That's a really good sign. If your dog responds to sit, if your dog responds to happily to hearing their name and they don't, you are too close. You are in their red zone and get them out. Work at it slowly. You got a lifetime with the dog and you definitely don't want them to feel anxious around people forever. So no discipline. Bring on high value treats. Bring on toys that they love. Stay, just like I said, stay calm. Whether the person's in your house or not, gradually watch them gain confidence based on the three things you're doing. You're putting yourself between what's making them upset. You're staying calm to model that everything's okay. And you're using space or distance, distance from what's frightening them and time to let them process that everything's gonna be okay. This is a slow and steady process. I have faith in you. The one thing I didn't overemphasize that I want to triple overemphasize now is the power of eye contact. If your dog is afraid of a person or gets anxious socially when they're engaging with other dogs or walking on a leash, direct eye contact and direct uh, motion into your personal space will cause a reaction in most dogs, period. So a dog that they see is staring at them and walking towards them into to what they perceive as their personal space will cause a reaction in most dogs. Some dogs will show just fear. They'll try to flee, they'll get behind you, or they'll try to move away. Some dogs will freeze, get very stiff, and other dogs might bark loudly or tug at the end of the leash. You would need a professional in there to determine if you have an aggressive, a purely aggressive dog that's barking in frustration and willing to attack. But again, most dogs are doing these reactions because they're afraid of what might happen. Now we know if your dog is afraid of other dogs, the best place to go is not a group class go to a group class, they're gonna completely implode. They'll have a panic attack. How will you know? They'll probably shit themselves. Don't think, oh, my dog is not well socialized. They think I'll do a group class or I'll take them to the puppy park or the dog park because that is too much for them to tolerate. You want to take a dog that might have anxiety with other dogs. Maybe you have a friend that has a dog. Get them used to walking behind the dog and simply following them then get them used to walking next to the dog. Now, if I have a friend and I have a socially anxious dog, 
where am I going to place myself when I'm walking next to my friend? Like in a parallel lines. I'm going to place myself between the dog, the other dog, and my dog. So I may have to do what I call a crossover. So I just tell my dog to walk on the other side of me so I am now between the dog and the distraction. If I'm too close to the dog that I'm walking with, what do I do? I get further away. I give my dog a little time to process that this other dog is not going to attack them. Mind you, you only work with dogs who don't have social anxiety. Because if you work with a dog that has social anxiety and your dog has social anxiety, it'll be a bad mix for obvious reasons. So you first start getting your dog more comfortable with other dogs by walking behind them. So you're like following the dog in front of you. This should be like a planned activity. So you should be walking the same pace. The other dog in front of you should be 15 to 20 paces in front of you. You are working at a distance in which your dog will take treats. You, if your dog won't take treats and it's tugging at the leash and it's barking your head off, you're way too close. But no front to front, no walking. If I see somebody walking towards me with my dogs, I don't care whether the owner is saying they're friendly. I don't care if they have a more relaxed posture. I care about my dogs. So I'm going to read them. Is this like a big Great Dane? Might be friendly, but my dogs see a small horse walking straight into their personal space. Um, is it a shepherd? Shepherds can be misconstrued as being aggressive to people and dogs because they have a very wolfish like look. Whatever. Maybe your dog's only afraid of tiny dogs that bark a lot or your dog's afraid of a husky because it got attacked by a dog with a curly tail once. Read your dog. Listen to your dog. Provide what they need. Space and distance, blocking, and a calm shoulder that's going to take care of them. We are moving on. Travel anxiety. Dog hates the car, won't get in it. Dog vomits in the car every time it's put. It shakes. It pants, it drools. This can be um, traveling. It can also be like many dogs feel veterinarian anxiety. They do it in the vet. They don't want to go in. Your dog is your dog. It's your child. Take care of what they need and slow down. Don't drag your dog into the vet or into the kennel or into the groomer just because you're late for a meeting. It's better to cancel the appointment, pay the late fee, and get your dog used to a place they're going to have to enter or get them used to the car gradually. There's no hurry. Slow and steady wins the race. So car anxiety is a tough one. Vet trainerian anxiety is a tough one. I'm often called just to get the dog comfortable with walking into the vet. That can take three or four weeks. It can happen in one day. I always use like high value, chicken, bologna, forget the processed stuff. I go for the meat. Now, if your dog, this is a fun fact, true appointment. Last week I had to get a Bernese Mountain Dog into the veterinarian for an x-ray and to be weighed. Uh, they've been trying, it was no go. Dog was, and a Bernese Mountain Dog, if you don't already know, can be like 120 pounds. Usually they're around 100. Fortunately, I imprinted. It's just a service where I take puppies and get them housebroken for a couple of weeks. I imprinted this dog, so she was deeply, deeply excited to see me. And still, she wouldn't get out of the door that was facing the vet. Now, what they hadn't tried is getting her out the other door because dogs don't always process things the way we do. So I pulled up for my bag of tricks, scurry, scurry. It's a little game I play where I run super fast across my yard or the floor of my house and my dogs chase me. I go scurry, scurry, we all run really fast and then I throw treats down. Um, that's a great technique if you have leash issues, but we'll save that topic for another day. So this dog wouldn't come in. I had, you know, I forget, I think she brought hot dogs in my hand. I was smelling like, you know, hot dog stand. Hold the hot dog to the dog, won't come out facing the vet. So then I go to the other door and I call her out and I throw some hot dogs at her and play find it for a second. And then I go scurry, scurry. And I ran into the vet before she even knew where she was going straight back into the exam room on the examination mat. It was all open for her. Uh, it was a straightaway. And she wasn't not anxious, but with hot dogs 
a little head massage. I did a course in the Tellington Touch. It's just pressure points that calm them down. That's a good um, thing to look up, the Tellington Touch. I was able to calm her. She was able to get her shots. She had to be anesthetized for her x-ray, so we let that happen. When they wanted to weigh her to see how much anesthesia, she wasn't going near the scale. So I said to them, can we pull it out into the middle of the floor? And they said, sure. And dogs, big dogs, don't like to walk on things near walls. It's just, if they don't like it, they don't like it. So pull the scale into the middle of the floor. I had one of my dogs there um, who's just a sweet little thing. And with hot dogs, I got her on the scale. Not joyfully, but I got her on the scale in like under two minutes. It was not happening when it was pressed against the wall, and it was not happening when they were pulling her. So, true fact, you have to go at the dog's speed. If the dog is afraid of every car, tail down, groveling, digging in their heels, you're not going to get her there by dragging her. And in fact, you'll make it worse. So how do you do it? Well, high value treats, meat is better than process. And you work at gradually getting the dog closer to the car. Once a dog is comfortable, you know, within three feet of the car, you take their favorite mat. I like to call it their security blanket. You know, maybe it's from the kitchen. Maybe you have to get just an, a flat mat with a non-skid surface that's easy to throw into the wash. The mat has to be out of the red zone. How do we know the red zone? The dog won't engage you. They're nervous. They lick their lips. Their eyes are scanning or maybe frozen. Um, ears down. Get them back further. Once they're in a place where they'll eat, they'll engage you, they'll roll on their belly, they don't feel scared, then you have to incrementally, and it's all up to the dog, Wahoo just came into the studio. Once you figure out what that red zone is, how close they can get to the car without losing their mind, start there. You can have a dog mat, sit down, you can give them dinner, if they like to eat. Some dogs will eat a Cheerio and like do a backflip. So do everything your dog loves and incrementally move closer to the car. Once you can get them closer to the car, you can invite one of their friends over, maybe a pal from the dog park, just a dog from the neighborhood that isn't afraid of the car, that thinks the car is like the funnest place to be. Now, in this case, your dog's close to the car. It just doesn't want to get into the car. So you sit in the car, you call dogs in the car, and your dog will see the other dog jumping in. And then you treat the other dog. And then your dog's like, what? They often fall for that. You can have one friend or family member holding your dog on the right side door while you walk around to the left side door, climb into the car, like on your belly, like you're doing combat crawl, and have hot dogs don't bait them with the hot dogs just play find it on the car seat your dog doesn't know you don't eat their treats so you can pretend often dogs are like wait a minute i want to play that game they jump in the car all of this is gradual if you have to take your dog because you have to get to a veterinarian appointment and you're not you don't have them comfortable with getting in the car yet try to lift them up even if you need two people Try to just carry them from the door into the car. You can even put like a light bandana over their head so they don't see where they're going. Because sometimes it can take up to a month of gradual uh, desensitization. Fun fact, you don't have to marry a clicker to get the benefits every once in a while. In fact, you can use a word to create a memory marker. So if I click and give my dog a treat, I click and give my dog a treat, I click all high value if I'm dealing with anxiety. I click, as soon as the dog hears a click, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna be like, where's my treat, where's my treat? So what I do is I click and I drop the treat on the floor and I say, find it. Click, drop the treat on the floor and say, find it. Why am I dropping the treat? Because dogs love to look for things, one. Two, it's a game, it's kind of fun to play, it's like, hiding Easter eggs instead of handing a kid a whole basket. And number three, anatomically, dogs are supposed to eat with their head down. If they eat with their head up, they often choke, gets caught in their breathing tube. So that's another fun fact. 
You can use a clicker or the word yes to mark the moment that they're getting braver. You might be somebody that likes to use a clicker all the time for everything, and amen, proud of you. I will do a whole episode devoted to clicker and word markers, but if your dog has anxiety and is comfortable with you clicking or comfortable with you saying yes, pair the click or the yes to rewarding them with a treat. And then in this instance of anxiety, you reward them with a click and a treat when they have recovered their fear response, when they seem more brave. That can be as simple as noting their breath. When does their breath are, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You run away from what's causing the fear. You take them away, give them a little time. And when they're, they return to normal, breathing, engaging with you normally, um, that's when you click and give them a treat. You wanna get them to shift from heightened fear to normalcy on their own. Teach them how to self-soothe and then reward the self-soothe. Okay, how does anxiety develop in the first place? A lot of people ask me this. So anxiety develops perhaps just nature. There's usually a dog in every litter that um, processes, sits back, thinks about it, gets startled when there's a sudden noise or an umbrella opens. That's, you can tell very early on if a dog has some genetic anxiety. It can happen because the dogs weren't socialized to everyday experiences and a vast, they didn't meet a vast array of people in those early um, weeks of life before 12 weeks. A dog can be anxious because you're mute. You know, they don't know what to do when an umbrella opens or the blender goes on and you just ignore them. They don't, they don't know what to do and they're like, they need a model. So sometimes it can just happen by chance, like there can be a loud noise, thunderstorm that frightens them and they don't have another dog or a person around and they're just more sensitive. So I see anxiety often when the people that they love their most, I call owners parents, when their parents are routinely disciplined for things a dog can't possibly comprehend, like, they jumped and ate a muffin, I don't know, 10 minutes ago. You left a muffin out on the table, you went out to take a shower, you come, it's gone, you yell at the dog. That's gonna create anxiety because the dog can't predict if you're happy or sad. And if you're yelling at the dog even 10% of the day, they're never quite sure where you're gonna land. Are you gonna love me? Are you gonna yell at me? Are you gonna love me? Are you gonna shock me with a collar or whack me on the butt? So our general reactions can create anxiety in a dog who would otherwise be more focused and um, acceptable. So there are a lot of reasons dogs develop anxiety. Some are much more intense. They're, they've shown now that the propensity to develop separation anxiety, deep, deep separation anxiety has a genetic foundation, has a genetic connection. So genes, experience, and your interactions kind of can all feed in. What you can do to prevent or fix anxiety. The number one way to prevent it is stay calm. Calmness is contagious. If I have a puppy or even a rescue dog that's afraid of a noise, they never heard a coffee grinder. Some are even afraid of just a door closing. They haven't been in a house or a floor. If I have a dog that's afraid of everyday noises, what I like to do is to record them when the dog's not there, play them low while I'm just sitting calmly. I might, I might record the doorbell and need to play it two rooms over at a low volume just to get my dog's brain conditioning to the sound. I, I might be able to have it play low at the dinner table while they're laying there. You don't know, it's your dog. You gotta figure out how much space, how much time, what's the right equation. If there's a sudden noise my dogs don't recognize, let's say on the street or when I'm walking or a dog I'm training, and right away, I'm pretty on the ball because I've been doing this 35 years, but if a dog's afraid of a car, I'll say, danger, danger, and run to the side. Even if I'm running through like a thicket or poison ivy, if my goal is to help my dog feel calmer, I'll go to any length. 
if you're afraid of poison ivy or there's no room, try to like mindfully map the driveways, the stores that I could escape into to help my dog process what's happening that's triggering such fear. Those are both preventing and fixing. Five and six week old puppies who are being raised at a good shelter or being raised by a good breeder will already be conditioned to a lot of sounds. Find that breeder, go to that shelter because they are helping you. The socialization window ends at 12 weeks. So if I have a dog who hasn't experienced anything remotely normal to a lifestyle before that time, I'm gonna have to take it slower and remember the three key points. Keep myself between the dog and what's distracting them. Stay calm and increase the space and time to give them the capacity to recover and move on. So thank you for joining me today. I know it's a blast of information. Really, it's meant to be an overview and encourage you to think of your life and your daily interactions from your dog's perspective. So if you feel like you need additional help, get it. You can look up trainers in your area. If you feel a virtual session with me would help, go on to my site, sarahodgson.com. My training is much more about me teaching you how to train your dog than me teaching your dog and then I go home. You can also look at the downloads, which will show you the different postures dogs use to communicate their feelings and communicate, period. Dogs are always thinking. We are always thinking. We just have to work on getting a common language so you're always understanding each other. If you found this podcast helpful, like it, share it, post it on your social media. Remember, you don't need to treat your dog wrong to get them to behave right.